Good day, folks, and welcome to the Stomp It podcast. Today I'm here with Jamie Grant. Welcome to Flim, Switzerland. It's great to be here. It's a beautiful location. Yeah, it's so nice here, isn't it? Have you ever skied here? No, no, sadly not. Skied Zermatt quite a lot, but haven't made it this far. Well, hopefully this winter you can come here. I'd love to. <laughs> well, before we get on, uh, I'd like to introduce you, if that's all right. Of course. So we're, here we are, Jamie. You got a passion for skiing. You got a master's degree in physics from Oxford and a PhD in economics, right? Yeah. From London Imperial College. Exactly, yeah. Nice. And if you combine these three things, you get Carve Digital Ski Coach, which is, which is this cool gadget you put in the ski boots that tracks your skiing. I use it myself to push myself to keep improving and finding little things to fine tune. So would you agree that's you? Uh, yeah, more or less. <laughs> I think I think the important thing was I started skiing late. So I started oh. when I was 18. So I really remember the pain of learning to ski. And I remember all those steps of gradually getting better. And, all right. And really with Carve, I was like, can we kind of accelerate that whole process? All right. So that's the the reason why you started Carve is because you could feel that pain late in life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I would, I would look at videos of myself mm -hmm. and... I, I'd be skiing and I'd be thinking, oh, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. And then I'd see a video of myself and I'd say, actually, you, you don't look so good. And then I'd try <laughs> and make a, you know, a change. Yeah. And really, you know, one of the big things about Carve is trying to give like real time feedback and trying to give objective feedback. So that having, so being able to get that feedback of actually you're not skiing very well mm -hmm. <laughs> in the moment was really kind of what, what kind of fired the idea for Carve. Like imagine if you could get feedback on your technique as you were skiing rather than seeing a video or maybe speaking to a friend to get a tip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the video feedback is obviously, it's fantastic too. Mm. I use it all the time during camps or uh, when I'm freestyle skiing, making cool edits or something, I have to look at it. But as you say, that's minutes, maybe hours, maybe days later. Mm. And I think the sports, science is really backing up that the sooner you get the video feedback for example um after the performance the better yeah yeah and as you were saying with carb you kind of get it instantly yeah yeah or after one turn we're talking a exactly. second late maybe yeah for us it's about like closing that feedback loop like closing it down and down and down as mm -hmm. much as you can yeah and that's where you are today but like how did you come about starting this company it's quite a wild idea mm, thank you like quite a, <laughs> It's a good idea, but it must have been quite tough to get started. Like, uh, yeah, certainly a lot of challenges, and um, you know, they've been very lucky at many different mm -hmm. points along the way to meet amazing people and to have amazing investors come on board. Um, I think, you know, really, it was my quite quite unique background in that um, I had a background in physics, so I thought a lot about, you know, how we, you know, physics and mechanics, and so. Mm. When I was skiing, I was always kind of thinking about the physics of skiing. Um, and then obviously as I was doing my PhD, I was spending a lot of time looking at statistics. So trying to think about um, turning large sort of sets of data sets of, fi of financial data into a meaningful piece of information about finance. So, mm -hmm. you know, a, a prediction of where the, you know, the, uh, uh, the stock index is going to go. That was essentially my PhD. And so when I was skiing, I was always kind of thinking to myself, I know that I'm skiing badly and I know that, that it can be measured because we have sensors from my physics degree. And I know that, well, I think if I could get hold of that data, maybe I could turn that into some kind of useful information that would help me in, improve. And so it was that kind of physics, advanced statistics and a bit of machine learning I did in my PhD, mm -hmm. um, all combined uh, and not being able to ski very well. So, you know, one, yeah, really that desire to improve. So you really started this idea with a, the customer of one. Yes, exactly. Like, you would like to have this. Yeah, yeah. I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have this? <laughs> yeah, it sure would be. Uh, it's actually, a, that's how I started too. Mm. I created the videos that a young Jens would have appreciated. Yeah, exactly. Because I, I grew up learning to freestyle ski by watching Often June Olsen. I just remember this one clip of June Olsen's Cork Ninth. I was watching over and over, yeah, frame by yeah. frame in VLC. Yeah. Or um, even earlier, like using DVD, it's really annoying yeah, on VHS yeah. to watch the tricks and then at best sometimes could film myself. So yeah. I think slow it, process. Yeah, I think it's that realization that oh maybe I can kinda of hack this 
you know, like, you know, there must be some way of hacking this problem I have, you know, yeah. I know these technologies, we have videos, in your case, mm -hmm. videos and me um, thinking about physics and statistics, there must be some way we can hack this problem. Uh, and obviously, you are a much different level to me <laughs> when you're trying to hack a cork nine to uh, yeah. improving a cup my carving turns. But it would be cool to see the data of a cork nine or like how if you would measure it. I've, like, yeah, how I've, would Andre Regetli do it versus an intermediate Cork 9 person, for example? And how can you become more like the, the World Cup level skiers? Yeah, one of our, one of our video team, um, it, uh, I think it was a 7, something crazy. Um, and the data looks crazy because if you're used to seeing normal skiing, it's mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, up and down as you kind of go from left to right. Mm -hmm. And then you see a Cork 9, just everything goes <laughs> haywire. Well then. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine that. I was just thinking about that. You should totally implement that as a game into the app, uh, like spin to win. Spin to win. You can spin the most in 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah. So you could do slope spins or... Yeah, some kind of Easter egg. Yeah, <laughs> like, it would be quite fun. Yeah, like you win, like you instantly win a pair of goggles or something. <laughs> yeah, something like that. So you started this with a business idea of one, please yourself. But, you know, once you've had the idea with the data mm. and sensors, like how did you go about going on from there like mm, I think what a big step yeah I think you know I I thought it would be very useful for me and, and I could see that um on the business side there'd be mm -hmm. there'd be a large market um and I think you know just just so many people have stopped having lessons but mm -hmm. try and improve and that's really where we that's our kind of sweet spot you know they're, mm -hmm. they're trying to like they're watching videos online um and they're, they're speaking to friends or they're getting a friend to video them and I thought you, you know you can look at the numbers and the market was 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 good and so mm -hmm. we um uh, you know i met my co-founder proof um and we actually started with the idea of just having an app mm -hmm. so we thought you know if, if you had a really good just an app and you had and you measured all the data from a phone because the phone has a lot of motion sensors yeah. we thought oh maybe that would be enough to give give you know give decent feedback on technique and we did that for about a year whilst we were both studying and then we realized at the end of the year that um to really kind of understand uh at least back then um how someone's skiing to give kind of useful information we'd have to make hardware mm -hmm. and so that was like a really big step because um you know having an app you can one day you can have one user the next day you can have a million mm -hmm. there's no there's no um, problem with scaling it and uh moving to hardware was, was a big step i probably one we didn't really appreciate how difficult it was because you know we we're very very naive mm -hmm. um i think that's a benefit of you know being naive is you know any, any sensible person would think this is totally crazy <laughs> whenever you know um trying to put hardware in a ski boot and and doing everything we've done but thankfully we didn't know how hard it would be mm -hmm. so we we started uh with the idea of hardware and then we basically pitched it some to some investors who have yeah. a um they basically have like a main office in china and so their whole concept is we take western companies and we plug them into the uh, ecosystem in Shenzhen, China, which is the best in the world for uh, making hardware. Mm -hmm. And so we went to, went, so Pruth and I um, went to China and basically uh, lived there for three months. And at the end of the three months, we had some pretty good hardware prototypes. Mm -hmm. And then we started skiing with them. We spent sort of nine months um, skiing with people, uh, collecting all the data, and then, um, and then getting uh, together a Kickstarter video. Mm -hmm. And then that was, and so that stage we didn't really know if anyone would like the product. You know, mm -hmm. we were, I was like, oh, this is great. I can, I can get better now. Like, you know, I've, I've solved the problem for the customer of one. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so there was that big kind of moment, you know, when we pressed go on the Kickstarter, mm -hmm. uh, does anyone like, else like this idea? <laughs> yeah. um, and thankfully they did. Um, so um, we, yeah, we launched the Kickstarter. It was the, uh, at the time it was the biggest ever Kickstarter in sports. Um, raising about $275,000. Sick. And then, so that was, yes, yeah, so it's kind of like incremental. So first we convinced some investors that it might be interesting. And then um, we worked on it very hard, collecting that basic kind of data sets and building mm -hmm. the basic units. And then we put it on Kickstarter and then we proved that the other people were interested. So mm -hmm. we didn't just have me interested. So that um, data set to clarify, it's basically the date of millions of turns mm. to see the difference between them. Yeah, well, back then it was just um, probably a few hundred turns, <laughs> oh, really? probably a few thousands, because okay. 
because that was um that, that that was before we had sort of mass market products okay so um you know this was back in 2015 2016 yeah and um our first task was to kind of ski with great skiers and understand how they what's good and bad mm -hmm. um speak to them trying to understand you know what do you look for and so we started to design the the basic framework of the system yeah um and then um you yeah, had very good feedback and then we put it on kickstarter okay so in those early days when you were analyzing data what was some uh, of the patterns uh, expert skiers had mm. early on can you remember what was like, oh, the yeah, first yeah. thing you could see yeah that's what a good skier yeah does, it's right? it's so exciting because um you know it, so, so my background is I would just look at graphs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my, as, well, as I just coming out of a five year, three, four, three or four years for my PhD and just looking at these like graphs of, you know, financial time series and mm -hmm. stock prices and things. And then uh, when you see a skiing graph, well, first of all, it's, yeah, it's so exciting because you see, a, you see a baby coming to life, but um, you can just, you, you can just start to get a feel for what the sensors pick up and how that relates to what you interpret so you know if you see someone that's a little bit unsure on their skis they step one ski then the other you see quite shaky the the left ski and the right ski don't have the same motions as mm -hmm. each other and then when you see when you and and maybe the kind of sort of jagged mm -hmm. um lines and then when you see a great skier um you just see uh, everything very smooth like no quick motions at all and you tend to see um, things moving together. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of combination was we'd, we'd speak to the top skiers and we'd say, what do you look for? And they'd say, well, we look for skis moving together. And, and we could see that in the data. So mm -hmm. it was really exciting to know that what they think they should see from a high level perspective, uh, we actually see in the data. And then the challenge was to turn that into um, essentially the characteristics of a skiing turn, mm -hmm. which build up the, the fundamentals of carb. Mm -hmm. So um, a really good example is uh, edge similarity. Mm -hmm. And that's basically how the edges move together. And, you know, if you're if you're an inter early intermediate skier, you're probably tilting one edge and then the other. Um, you know, you're not nicely moving together and you're probably sort of doing sort of s single motion. So you're, you're setting the edge, you're holding it mm -hmm. and then you're setting the edge and then you're holding it. Mm -hmm. And so what you see in that is so from an edge similarity perspective, you essentially see um, if, if someone's doing one edge and the other, then the edge similarity just is, is low. So one moves one way and one moves the other way. Mm -hmm. um, and so that really kind of penalizes your edge similarity score. Mm -hmm. And then as you get better, so that's kind of an intermediate level, then you start tilting those edges together. So imagine like a railroad um, drill mm -hmm. that an instructor might give. So when you start tilting those edges together, then you see that edge, edge similarity metric go up. Mm -hmm. And what's great is even at the t very sort of top echelons, mm -hmm. like the advanced gears, you, you just see like the details of, you know, then it becomes like the nuances. You, you know, sometimes someone might have like, oh, my knee, my right knee is a bit sort of dodgy. And so the end of my left turn is, is, is not as good as the end of my right turn. Then, you, you know, you'll see that kind of slight opening mm -hmm. between those two lines. And then that's picked up by the edge similarity metric. Mm -hmm. So, you know, an intermediate might be getting 30 or 40 edge similarity. Um, but even like an advanced skier might be trying to go from sort of 90 to 95 mm -hmm. percent edge similarity. Um, so, yeah. And, um, and another thing is smoothness. So mm -hmm. going back to those graphs that I already you know, originally saw, you could see that you could eyeball the sm smoothness and then we basically parameterize it. So every time you finish a turn, mm -hmm. you get a smoothness. Obviously, you're not hearing it in real time, but it's calculated. Mm -hmm. um, and just great skiers have are just smooth. <laughs> so, you know, if you, a lot of it comes to the knees, of course, if you're mm -hmm. bending the knees and you're taking in the, in the bumps, mm -hmm. then um, you just very nicely, uh, all, all the graphs, the pressure graphs, for instance, mm -hmm. which we measure pressure from the, the units, uh, essentially is, is, it looks very smooth. Mm -hmm. um, probably one more is the, uh, um, another metric we have is called dynamic balance. Mm -hmm. So people think you should be just forward all the time and, mm -hmm. uh, but actually you should be kind of moving around and um, going, going forward at the beginning of the turn and then kind of releasing a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so we, we pick up that. So you see that kind of, that weight kind of moving back and forward on the, on the bottom of the units. Throughout the turn. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I, I can help clarify that a little bit. So basically, mm. this is something intermediates always do wrong or they just never told early on in your skiing that that's something you should do. And it's nice that you guys pick it up and clarify it. So basically, when you're on the top of a turn, 
Well, when you go into a turn, basically on the top third or so, no, it's hard to do with just audio. <laughs> So you go into a turn, then you want to have like a maximum forward pressure, and then you go to the middle of the turn where you're pointing skis straight down the hill, pretty much in the middle, and then you move towards the heel, and then you got to go from the heel, then in the next step into the next turn, furthest forward basically, mm. and it's a very difficult move, mm -hmm. and people, I think people are told about it or instructed about it too late. Mm -hmm. And maybe it should be brought into people's development a little earlier. Mm. I think uh, we instructors maybe shy away from it mm. because we have such big issues getting people just being neutral and yeah. not being backseated. Yeah, basically. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I, I like that you guys are highlighting that to lots and lots of uh, intermediate skiers to yeah. data. Yeah. But but it is it's difficult to do it right. Mm in the beginning yeah and it's always a challenge for us you know like mm -hmm. you know especially because we're not there in person to try and capture all these nuances of the different levels of a skier's progression and, and make sure the system kind of catches the problems and so people kind of funneled along into one sort of learning journey and if, mm -hmm. if they are going off then we can you know the system naturally catches them mm -hmm. so obviously initially you're kind of focused on being forward but then as you as you progress in the system then most people focus on being relatively forward because they're back seats but then as you progress in the system it becomes more important for the um, dynamic balance mm -hmm. as you said all right so if you'd summarize that what was like the the top three metrics you've discovered top three metrics um so Cool. Well, the ones you mentioned, basically. Oh, but the ones just I mentioned, to yeah. summarize it for the listeners, because yeah. maybe got a little bit wide and so. Yeah. <laughs> so what are the top three lessons you learned from expert skiers data? Yeah, so uh, number one, um, the edges move together. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a metric called edge similarity, and it just looks at how the edges tilt together throughout the turn yeah. and how they tilt back. Um, so provided you're not doing your step your turn in two steps then you're, you're, you're starting to get good scores on that yeah and then even at the very advanced skiers it's the it's the nuances of how they mm -hmm. of how they move together um the next is pressure smoothness yeah so um if you are sort of nimble and light on your knees and you're bending your knees mm -hmm. then um, and, and you anticipate bumps or any kind of train you have then the underlying pressure that the calf sensor measures mm -hmm. Is actually very smooth because mm -hmm. um, your your body is naturally taking in the bumps, mm -hmm. um, and so we see that as as, as very good pressure smoothness metric. Yeah. Um, and then the last one, uh, I'll probably I haven't mentioned, but uh, I'd say it's edge angle. It's um, it, as you can ski better once you can hold that edge. It's it's a simple one, mm -hmm. um, but as you can hold that edge, we can we can see the edge and, and holding that through the turn is uh, a very good indicator of uh, a good skier mm -hmm. if you're carving. Do you have um, a little drill or exercise people can do to improve each of these three things? Uh, yes. So um, edge angle and um, edge angle and uh, edge similarity mm -hmm. are done very well through carving training. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially, what it does is it uh, focuses on one and then focuses on the other. Yeah. Um, and then pressure smoothness is is actually kind of embedded in other other parts of the product. So there isn't like a direct. Mm -hmm. um, uh, lesson for it but it is uh, it is embedded in the pressure um, drills we have all right so that's some digital drills <laughs> may I add some in uh, yeah, please, real life uh, drills yeah. there so with the edge similarity I've, I've shown it in videos before but and you mentioned it, a simple railroad drill basically you have a green run a t super flat and you basically just roll the feet inside of the ski boots and that way you're really engaging the feet and the feet are really good at fine motor skills well if you just clonk the knees they're so strong they just overpower your feet so you start with the feet doing these smooth simple motions and then let the knees come slowly and then you do these railroad drills if that's really hard for you you can put a pole across your knees and then grab your kneecaps and the pole and that way basically force the distance of the, the legs to be the same. And then you could try the same thing, for example. And that's going to help with that uh, edge similarity. Mm. But also with the smoothness we talked a little bit about. What was the next one? Edge angle. Edge angle. Ooh. Um, here, feel the position. Um, since I'm here in a chair, 
You can imagine that you toward, lean towards a wall, for example, and feel this more aggressive stance where you get the hip far, far on the inside of the turn, perhaps leaning against the wall. When you do this, be careful that you don't twist the hip outward to just maximize that edge angle because that, that's going to lead the outside ski to go away. And that's pretty lame, right? You've seen that in the data, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so maintain that hip same direction as the skis roughly. And uh, after you felt that position, you go and uh, maybe on a red run, carve with some speed so that you dare to lay it over, move on the inside of the turn and you'll get a bit higher edge angle. Uh, did I touch on all the drills? Uh, all the ones you mentioned, yeah. Yeah, the... so edge similarity. Edge angle and smoothness, pressure smoothness. And smoothness could touch on that one too. On smoothness, I'd like to mention another one that I think people should do more often, which you can do in the app with a metronome. Mm, okay. Or, if I don't misremember, basically you can just count while you're turning, like one, two, three, and then one turn is done maybe. To, as some people rush it, mm. do too many turns, like make them a little bit big, but close them. Mm, mm. We're closing the turn, I mean, make it like a C kind of. And then the next one. And let each turn have its own face. Yeah. And that's also going to help later on with the most difficult metric to get good at, the, that dynamic uh, movement that you're moving forwards mm. and backwards throughout the turn, which are kind of tricky. Yeah. But these are, re I think, it's cool that you guys could measure these things so well. Yeah. Um, I would like to see that carb would also have an upper body sensor is that ever going to come um i so we do use the phone sensor so we use the phone sensor uh we haven't fully incorporated the data yet but we do measure the data from the phone so mm -hmm. our kind of um our longer term objective is to try and use the phone sensor ah cool but most of our most of our r d is we we try and um do everything we can with the sensors we have that's the kind of that's the that's the skill of making the product yeah. um, because every time you kind of add a sensor, you know, we, we always want to carve to be for sort of every skier. And so as we add more sensors, we obviously make it more expensive mm -hmm. and, and, and harder to make. So we're trying to, we're trying to keep like the cost down as much as possible so we can have as many people on the system. Yeah. Yeah. I guess sometimes I, I would like to measure my upper body too, mm. Mm. especially maybe on, you could make games. <clears throat> Imagine powder short turns. Yeah. Keeping a really stable upper body. Yeah. Like pointing down the hill, have the legs do their thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's just a little um, added to my Christmas wish list. <laughs> I'll send it over I'll after ask the this guys. podcast. <laughs> oh, that's um, cool. Um, in the beginning of this, like, what was the biggest hurdles you overcame mm. in order to make a product you could use? Um, yeah, you know, I think, uh, it's difficult to, to really name, you know, to isolate one, every, every part was, was pretty difficult. I think, um, the, th one of the things I'm, I'm very proud of is just, uh, it's just the team, uh, actually sort of going to China and making a mass production product. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, to make a physical product in, in China at, at a small scale. So only making sort of 3000 units in mm -hmm. the first batch, um, was a real, real undertaking and uh, a, real, a, a real achievement to get you know to get those out the door and i think um i'm, I'm sure many people have backed kickstarter campaigns and and not every not every campaign does it so no. i'm very proud that we we got it out you got it out there were you yeah. delayed like most we were delayed yes <laughs> <laughs> but yes. i think people were happy once they got it i think um, it was a functioning product yeah, I, I'll, I'll admit now that we were very ambitious uh, in our initial timelines. Mm -hmm. um, I think, like many Kickstarter campaigns, and um, you know, when we when we started missing that, when we thought we missed the season, we thought, you know, there's no point in shipping a product in March. Mm -hmm. um, let's just spend like an extra six months really making sure it's right, um, because it's a uh, yeah. Once you once you ship it, um, there's not a lot you can do, uh, especially when you're a small company. Uh, at Kickstarter, at Kickstarter stage. Yeah. Shit, must have been so stressful. <laughs> May I ask, um, this is maybe to help poke hole on another. Some people think it's a little bit gimmicky and don't believe it works when I mm -hmm. talk to other instructors. And I got to tell them my experience that I think it do work. 
um, like how much, if you may disclose this, how much did it cost to develop this technology up to this date, roughly? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, well, it's, um, it's, it's sort of public information, but we've raised over, you know, $10 million in funding. So, um, and plus, most of it has gone to development of yeah, software exactly. and hardware. And, 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 and obviously we've been making money as well. So certainly in the tens of millions of dollars, is a, is a, it would be a good, good ballpark figure. It's an expensive sensor. <laughs> I think it's not everyone that grasps that. Yeah, you know, it's it's everything. It's all the details of the hardware. It's the teams um, speaking to coaches, understanding what coaches are looking for, teasing out all the information that we can get from the data. Mm -hmm. It's um, creating large scale machine learning models um, that, you know, we have terabytes of like tens of terabytes of, of just data, people skiing mm -hmm. and like crunching all that data. When we when we change it, just takes mm -hmm. some very careful algorithm design and of just time as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of work that goes into every part of the product. Yeah, I find the people who also think it's gimmicky are also sometimes afraid of losing their jobs. What do you tell ski instructors who feel the competition from you guys? Um, I think really the reception we have from ski instructors is you know we work with some of the best in the world like like yourself, and I think um, many people just for years they've been kind of talking about. Uh, you know, what goes on inside a boot or, mm -hmm. I, you know, is it more important to have a high edge angle or, you know, do you have to move your edges together or, or do people actually move the edges together? Mm -hmm. And um, for, the, for most of the certainly skin instructors we've worked with, it's, it's really positive because they're just so excited that suddenly someone's actually kind of trying to, uh, you know, create objective information about um, how we ski. Mm -hmm. And so we, you know, we always find that the, the instructors that are really trying to push the industry are yeah, it was almost coming to us and and and, and working with us and like developing uh, partnerships where they kind of have them on their camps or or use Carve as a tool mm -hmm. um, to sort of start the conversation around certain aspects of skiing and and provide that kind of objective information to to power through. Yeah, yeah, we use it at our ski technique yeah, camps. Exactly. Yeah, and um, about half the guests maybe they bring their own. They already have it. Awesome. <laughs> And that's why I tell some friends in the ski instructor world, those who are not so happy about this technological mm. competition, maybe some mm. see it as, I see it as a, a good thing. Yeah. Because I think it's going to highlight the, the faults of people. Mm. And while you can learn quite a lot through the app, mm. I think eventually the better you get, um, the closer you're going to get to a plateau if you don't mm -hmm. maybe deal with some upper body, yeah. lower body connections. And that's when you need coaching, video analysis, such mm -hmm. things from uh, another external source, basically. Yeah. To push people up. Because it's uh, in the uh, ski instructor world, it's a bit notoriously difficult to get the average skiers to actually mm -hmm. work on their skiing. And. Um, that's one of my passion projects a little mm. bit to highlight to the world skiers you and you <laughs> and me we're not as good as we think and we could become much better yeah and kind of show how how good one can be mm. not me or like look at the best ski racers in the world they're just miles away from me who's like i'm quite good yeah but they're miles away yeah the best instructors in the world, they're still pretty far away from those top mm. races, obviously. Yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, even if they might, the instructors might ski with a certain finesse and fluidity, that's quite nice to watch. But they're not the fastest in the world. Yeah, I So I've been thinking about making this video for years that I haven't <laughs> bothered doing it. Basically, I would like, do you know about the Dunning-Kruger effect? Oh yeah, the uh, so yeah, first it goes up and then it goes right down. Then yeah. You, yeah, yeah. So it's basically so. this lovely graph where you have, um, skill along the horizontal axis and then as you go up you you get confidence exactly so basically if you do a um, beginner's course in something or the first ski instructor uh, license for example you go boom high confidence but your knowledge is actually pretty low yeah and uh, they call it mount stupid and then you learn more and all of a sudden you're gonna feel like shit i know nothing because you're starting to grasp yeah how good the best in the world are yeah and how damn far away you are and then you get the slope of enlightenment so i'd like to make a video that brings 
I don't know, attack that a little bit. Mm, mm. Help people go from Mount Stupid to, to the bottom. Slope, yeah, to the, <laughs> and then up again. Yeah, to the bottom or the slope of enlightenment. Yeah. Or move the slope of enlightenment closer to the beginning stages, mm. to the first and second and third year of skiing. Yeah. Because um, I find it incredibly inspiring. It's, yeah. a, it's a rude graph, isn't it? Calling it Mount yeah. Stupid. <laughs> but I find it just so inspiring. Yeah. If you can get people to the bottom sooner, <laughs> but with encouragement, yeah. like here are a couple of milestones, you know, yeah. work on these things and you'll feel great. Yeah. And I think your um, device is quite good at taking people down. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think the skill is to do it in such a way that isn't too demoralizing. <laughs> yeah, you do a fine job. It cuts you try, know, yeah. You gamify it. You got happy sounds. That's yeah, uh, yeah. good and encouraging. But yet you're like shit. My ski IQ or edge angle. It's only this much. Yeah, yeah. While experts are having way more. Yeah, I think I think there is, um, especially people. Sometimes we find that people because they ski they, they kind of confuse skiing fast with being good at skiing mm -hmm. and they'll ski very fast and they'll kind of be like oh i, I don't understand you know um my ski aq is only 110 but i'm the fastest in the group and it's like well you know can you show, you know, show us a video of your skiing and you can see they're just sort of straight lining and then you know breaking at the end mm -hmm. and really carves about trying to like really like enjoy the beauty of like the beauty you know a, a great carving turn when you really feel like the g-force of the turn mm -hmm. going from turn to turn and, and we, we you know we want to unlock that mm -hmm. for every skier but to kind of guide people towards that we have to first you know um sort of penalize if people aren't doing that so mm -hmm. um there's definitely that kind of um pathway that we try and take people on we try and do it in a, in a positive way as, as much as possible but i think there can be that kind of reset if, if people are just used to getting to skiing fastest doesn't necessarily equate with good technique. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of those things that irritate me a little bit on the mountain, but it's fine. We all do it for the speed. Uh, but if you're one of those people who ski, like you said, <laughs> really fast, <laughs> and you make this S turns that are maybe a meter and a half wide, and you just kind of do a railroad drill down a black run super fast, it's not that exciting. Yes, speed is cool, but you'll achieve a greater sense of satisfaction. Just slow it down a little bit, but turn much sharper and just experience those uh, G-forces. Mm. How you're like shooting out of one turn into the next. Yeah, yeah. It's going to feel really fast, even if you're not that fast compared to the person yeah. going straight down that black run. Yeah, exactly. A little bit on edge. Yeah. <laughs> And it's one of the beautiful things where I think the average skier is missing out um, because they're notoriously difficult to get into ski schools and actually go and mm. learn skiing uh, or get better, probably because they don't know how much better they could still get, mm. is that as long as I've been skiing, I've been getting better. And the feelings and sensations I get inside my body when turning, they're just getting better. Yeah. Have you experienced exactly. that too? Yeah. I, yeah. You, this is exactly our kind of philosophy. It's like there's these people out there, they're kind of like they're having fun, they're, you know, they're having a nice time on the slopes, but mm -hmm. they could be having so much more fun. They could be getting so much more out, out of their time. Mm -hmm. And and really what we want to do is kind of unlock that, you know, you are here and we want to take you like up here. Yeah. And that and that's what we try and try and do with Carl. It's like what you're saying, you know, mm -hmm. that's why you run the camps, it's what it's what you see when you see people kind of, you know, they're buzzing around, but they're not they're not having the best time they could because, yeah, for for us, our, our philosophy is like, you know, it's when you really get into the beauty of like a, like a perfect kind of carving turn and you start to really feel, yeah, you know, exactly popping from one turn to the mm -hmm. next is, is where you get the start to get the most out of the sport. And you're right, you know, I've, I've still got so much to learn. <laughs> My ski IQ is 149 at the moment and, um, you know, I've still, <laughs> well, it's, still it's, it's okay, it's okay. Um, but uh, there's always, you know, there's, I'm, I'm probably still maybe like 500th in the world or something. So definitely some, some progress to make. <laughs> yeah. Or what have I got? 156 maybe at best. Yeah, yeah. I think it gets, like it that. gets a lot hard. Every point is very hardly won. You know, it's very hard to win when you get from mm -hmm. 149 to 150, 151. I might be exaggerating, but a couple no, of no. points over 150. Yeah, I, I think it is 156, 157. Yeah. And it, it kind of tops out about 160. Like that's, yeah, you know, and you gets. really have to kind of find that perfect run and get everything. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's kind of funny for those who are trying to hack Ski IQ. Basically, find a perfect pitch. It's flat. Or like yeah. it's steep enough. Steep, yeah. yeah, steep. <laughs> but, you can make. Some but but no rollers, no bullshit. Yeah, you gotta get the perfect data. Yeah. Start tracking on the top. Yeah. And then end immediately after. No <laughs> we bullshit. We don't encourage this, but it's what people do. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they do. I don't think I have done it that exactly, like roughly that. You know, I haven't tracked a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> Just then you're not gonna get such a good score. No, it's fair enough. If you know, yeah. Uh, we're actually working on some improvements to to make it a little bit fairer, so that it, it's um, we we naturally get rid of the turns which we think you mm -hmm. probably didn't want to have in the in the skier queue calculation. Yeah, yeah. We're sitting here next to a church, so the bells go off sometimes. Yeah, it's very alpine. It is very alpine village. <laughs> We need, we need some cowbells running mm -hmm. some cows in the background um what is the thing you've been struggling with in your own skiing um that's a good question uh i think um for me actually it's probably my offbeat skiing yeah um so uh carve is not at the moment focused on off-piece but no. there's some there's some uh we're, we're doing a lot of work around it and i, I want to we won't have anything this season uh other than just detection of off-piece but i really want to make that something we do over the next few years mm -hmm. um and uh yeah essentially um uh i yeah I'd, I'd love to be have a kind of better uh control over difficult terrain and mm -hmm. um you know dropping off small small drops and things like this right. um and um yeah because i'm i ski a lot on piece which is great and um i, I think i'm in a very good position there mm -hmm. um i don't ski as much as i'd like to off piece i also ski quite a lot out of season so i ski a lot early season and i see a ski a lot late season so i don't get as much time off piece as i like yeah i see but a lot of people have this complaint and uh, mm. what i would chip in with you then is just let the terrain be your teacher yeah leave that slope and ski lots of difficult terrain because mm. you got the nice base yeah at least with the carb turns how are your short turns yeah yeah pretty good like that right. my short turns off piece uh, uh anywhere on piece. on piece they're good <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the uh, my my high ski IQ is a short turn. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and uh, in the off pieces, so get a lot of mileage in in difficult terrain of various steepness, and it can be like easy moguls, a little tracked, good powder, bad powder, wind blown. Mm. Just ski all of it. Yeah, anytime you have the chance, um, I make sure I do it like every day at the end yeah. of the ski yeah. day. I ski the bullshit down <laughs> yeah it's good <laughs> pretty yeah, hard yeah, yeah just you know it gets the legs going fired up yeah um add some strength yeah uh, yeah that's my main tip on uh, <laughs> free riding you know you can get more in detail but uh terrain is just one of the best yeah, teachers yeah. when it comes to off-piste skiing especially yeah. if you like you have a pretty good on-piste technique mm. then it's not too hard to ski off-piste yeah you just want to monitor that you're not ending up back seated. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because that's really going to mess with your yeah. speed and control and everything. Yeah. Yeah, so this season we're doing a lot of work to um, uh, basically work out people off piece. So we mm -hmm. so we know that, that that train is off piece. And then once we have like a, a better and better data set off piece, we can start trying to score that as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, oh, that makes me i want it to snow soon <laughs> have you seen there's a little bit on the mountain uh, above us up there oh amazing yeah uh, but it's so little yet yeah. it's only 11th of october today so we don't have snow yet but i was skiing yeah. in dubai last week Ooh. yeah yeah actually uh yeah there's a there's a good kind of snowfall over the weekend um and a little bit of a cold snap so it was actually quite quite nice groomed terrain um, definitely not not time for not it wasn't uh, time for off piece yet, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, on piece is pretty good. Um, oh, that made me think. Has the data you've uncovered taught you anything about the equipment? Mm. Um, certainly, uh, uh, the, there's certainly some learnings around types of ski and, and obviously the radius. So okay, um, you see people. Uh, it's kind of obvious really but like as you as you move through different types of ski mm -hmm. um you, you can create these kind of very whippy turns mm -hmm. and so we we see that in the in the in the, in the dynamics of all the data so because mm -hmm. we because we track the edge but then we also see the amount of rotation yeah so people do tell us the radius but we can also track um what radius we think the ski is mm -hmm. so as people kind of 
go into those kind of whippier skis and you you, you see a kind of slightly sort of changes in the mm -hmm. in, in, in the whole dynamics of skiing okay. um i think we're the the research we're doing on equipment is still kind of early stage so it's one of those things where um we collect the data right now so we ask mm -hmm. people what um equipment they have but we haven't really um unlock the power of that data so right. you imagine um you know we could start to give people recommendations for boots we could say yeah people like you when mm -hmm. you have these kind of boots when you move to these kind of boots you actually improve your skiing ski iq by like five points and okay. the same with skiing or you could recommend someone for the way you ski you should be skiing at a smaller radius ski uh -huh. um so there's kind of very exciting things that we can do in Ooh. equipment <laughs> but we haven't done it yet yeah we're still like very focused on you know like mm -hmm. creating that powerful kind of core mm -hmm. experience all right um uh, so you also haven't no date on the boots yet either but maybe it will be so we have the data from boots but we mm. don't uh use it yet so we just kind of collect it in the background and we know that we, we can come back to it at some stage and start processing mm -hmm. it well sick what do you see um, what are some future things that might come in ski tech that you're working in um i think uh well for us uh really it's just about kind of broadening the um broadening the use cases of carbs so i think you know we've started at the beginning of the adoption curve to use another startup kind of <laughs> methodology this this concept of you have innovators and you have early adopters yeah. and um you know and our innovators were our kickstarters and then we're moving through to like to widen that appeal of carb mm -hmm. and so you know we just want to make carb more and more fun so it appeals to more and more people mm -hmm. and so that's our kind of that's our kind of like north star and um you know everything we do is 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 aimed towards that uh, in, t in terms of the features that we try to that we're working on to deliver that mm -hmm. um, we're doing a lot uh, this year with uh, Ted Ligeti so mm -hmm. uh, we've got this partnership to really kind of you know it's interesting how you're saying some of the best skiers in the world and the way they ski you mm -hmm. know um, I was skiing with Ted um, in June in Mount Hood and uh, it's really phenomenal <laughs> to <laughs> just watch that guy and um, it was quite exciting skiing with him because I just wanted to look at his data and so what we're trying to do is um, to kind of elevate the, the core experience of, of, of our system to make mm -hmm. it more fun is, is, you know, take those learnings of TED and then build that into um, the system. Okay. We're also working on video to make, um, to help people kind of understand uh, what the visual is, um, you know, of their friends and of themselves and, and, and how that compares to Ski IQ. Mm -hmm. So I could video you um, with Carve mm -hmm. and then every turn I could see what, what ski iq got for that turn oh, right. and so it's quite nice because you see the graph and, you, and then you see someone do a good turn and then the graph goes up nice. and you kind of like you kind of get this kind of visual feedback so it's kind of funny because it's obviously going back to the to the original thing with carb where you need mm -hmm. to you know my original reason for carb which was like the delayed feedback loops but now we have that instant feedback in the small way it's like great to get back to that visual feedback with the with the mm -hmm. app um, love it since i love video analysis yeah exactly <laughs> and i like data um yeah. awesome so i'll be able to film let's say a, a camcast yeah and then so we do one run film it so the person skiing might hear feedback if we yeah, want they can to hear feedback yeah if yeah. we want to and then we stop down at the lift and then we yeah. can watch this and see the ski iq yeah of every yeah. turn yeah yeah That's exactly pretty cool. so they could they could put the ski iq monitor on so they mm -hmm. can hear ski iq every turn and then they can hear it and then uh, when they come back when they come to you at the at the bottom of the turn mm -hmm. uh, so at the bottom of the run then you videoed it and when they're close to you then that data will just go from their phone to your video and be matched on your phone Sick. they get it on their phone as well automatically mm -hmm. just for the cloud and then you can kind of just skim through the mm -hmm. the video um to kind of look at each each turn and, and how good it is so it's it's a nice way of kind of getting that kind of turn um turn level feedback rather than a kind of just a summary ski iq so you think oh it felt like a good run but you know and maybe you think oh i got one turn bad and you can see it was that bad turn mm -hmm. That's cool. Um, will I also be able to add the metrics for, say, um, edge angle similarity to the video? So we don't have that right now. But it might come. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll put, put a word in. I'll add it to um, my Christmas wish <laughs> no, list. Yeah, it's a long list. Keep the team busy. <laughs> um, we, do have a, we, we do have a mode where you can, so, you know, when you look at the date of that run, mm -hmm. you obviously have the video, um, and then you can look at a kind of graph of like, um for each turn in that run 
uh, what was the edge similarity. So you can kind of see it. We just don't have the video alongside it yet. All right. Um, it's a good idea. Thank you. Yeah, well, I just felt... Well, if I film a um, camcast, for example, I look at it. First, mm. I want to have like an, an, a big picture view yeah. of it. Yeah. Ideally, full speed. This is a tip for you if yeah. you watch yourself too. Start with full speed. Get the big picture movement. Is something wonky going on? Okay, on the every right foot turn. Something. He got more edge angle every time. Okay. And uh, then do it in slow motion and look at this detail you picked up on. Okay, what's going on with the right foot turns yeah. versus the left turns? Why is having a better achievement there? And then at the same time, we'll get that data, ski IQ. Yeah, look at it. It's better on the the left yeah, or the right. Or exactly. Whatever it might be. It'd be cool. So I'd love to uh, have on the wish list uh, edge similarity, edge angle, <laughs> all of your metrics, basically. I can see the data science team. Uh. <laughs> Getting busy. <laughs> yeah, there'll be, uh, say, stomp it, Jens. <laughs> Send me his Christmas wish list. Yeah. <laughs> the things you would like to have. Uh, no, I, I, I like this. This is, this is going to be cool. Mm. Well, um, when are you going to start doing freestyle skiing in uh, Calf? It's a good question. It's yeah. something. Um, it's something we talked about at Kickstarter campaign, mm -hmm. and I, I have to admit, it's um, we, we we surveyed the users, and we we basically said, "What do you want?" Mm -hmm. And there wasn't that many um, that actually wanted freestyle. So we we prioritized um, other parts of, of the company, you know, other 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 parts of feature set. Mm -hmm. um, but I can I can imagine, you know, as we kind of you know, talked about, as we grow carve to a wider wider user mm -hmm. base. Um, we can we can start doing things with the freestyle skier. I would love it, you know, imagine if you, uh, like right now we have skier key for a turn, but imagine you learn a trick and you mm -hmm. and you have a kind of score for that trick, which yeah. is to do with like, you know, how nicely you did it, how you how well you landed it. Mm -hmm. It's all it's all very doable. It's kind of stuff that excites us. But um, I think one of the hardest things about the company, and obviously, you, you know, you, you probably see this yourself, is mm -hmm. like, there's so many cool stuff, you, so many cool things you can do, and you really mm -hmm. have to try and focus on one or two things that you think will deliver the most value for your user, your user base, yeah. over the whole user base. Um, and considering it costs tens of millions to uh, <laughs> exactly give good feedback on turns, mm. freezer skiing is basically made up by many different types of turns. Yeah, exactly. It, it would, I think it would be quite a difficult challenge. You could break it down maybe to something simple as sliding rails or the f the perfect pop maybe mm. like how to jump yeah I like such a mode yeah exactly people yeah. are uh, really struggle at popping properly off jumps yeah um, where it could be quite easy to break it down the data mm. yeah maybe and I've seen you do some you know some of your videos you help people for those like basic parts of jumping yeah. and 360 and and things like this so. Um, yeah, that you know, that's the way we'd attack it, certainly. Um, but we just, yeah, right now we're very focused on that kind of like that core kind of on piece carving experience. Like mm -hmm. we, we just think there's so much value for the, the average skier to have within a, a better on piece experience that um, we're, we're focusing our efforts there. Mm -hmm. So outside of the future stuff going on inside of Carb, since you're a tech CEO, yeah. things are going well. Have you heard any other technology things that might be on the horizon in the ski industry that people haven't mm. heard? I think there's like a really amazing kind of general movement uh, mm -hmm. in, in the ski industry uh, to just become more connected. So mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, things like Stomper is great because people are kind of watching videos and then commenting on videos. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's not just about skiing on, on piece, but it's also about like our time when we think about skiing mm -hmm. and we're kind of getting so much more value in our kind of like off, off mountain experience by being more connected on the slopes. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's some great innovations around um, ski passes. So uh, it looks like we're going to have ski passes with our mobile phones, which is nice. We don't have to kind of always think about having to, um, you know, uh, remember our ski pass. It's like, mm -hmm. it's, it's like we do on the tube in London. You just have it on your phone. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of advances, just just kind of small advances in lifts that are kind of getting quicker and things like this to just mm -hmm. kind of amp our skiing days. Um, I think there's, the more data that we can get from our skiing days, the the better memories we can form as well. So um, even if you don't have an app running, you can also get like just of your ski pass, you can mm -hmm. get like a record of your of your skiing days. So I think 
yeah any any kind of tech in skiing and um i can i think can amplify the experience and i think mm. a lot of the really good advances coming out are really focused on um connecting us and so we can get more value and, and, and better memories and shared memories for our experience of the mountains yeah well sounds good because i i always think that anything that you measure will get managed um, wasn't henry ford maybe yeah said that. yeah <laughs> what gets measured gets managed um and obviously inside the boots what's going on there here in locks your ticket tracks a bunch of stuff exactly yeah you got leaderboard who did the most vertical meters of the day who used the park lift the most times nice um competitions against your friends in vertical meters such things yeah because here they yeah they're strong on the technology too yeah uh do you have an advice for me how should i uh keep up in the world of uh, technology you know i do my best we do videos we use carve at the camps do you see anything yeah i think you that know we if, use? well I, I really think if you're using carve at the camps like you're really kind of at the forefront because um uh you're basically become you know you're uh working with us you've spoken mm -hmm. to our data team as well uh to to sort of see like what can we push the you know the carve experience mm -hmm. and then also like what el what other features can we give to mm -hmm. you to elevate your camp so um yeah i would i would argue that we're at the forefront of <laughs> skiing technology mm -hmm. and and by using that kind of video integration and giving feedback and uh, to us we can mm -hmm. push it forward I, i really think you're you're at the cutting edge um, um yeah but it, yeah what are you saying there about the future it made me really think like mm. what is important it made me just think that uh, uh tracking things in stages also with the freestyle skiing mm. just maybe make a print a little pamphlet basically a bunch of freestyle skills mm. that you uh, during a freestyle camp for example yeah yeah um pop properly yeah yeah five uh, eight out of ten should be good yeah yeah i don't know something that needs a lot of repetition 180 box yeah. slide like a whole list of skills <laughs> that should be achieved within a week for example yeah just like track it on paper for now Sounds really cool. until you guys have the freestyle yeah right now it's in paper i can see uh i can see our lawyers quivering <laughs> at the thought of people doing 180s and what well, of us encouraging people uh, to do yeah, <laughs> things like this maybe i think we'll get there but um yeah i think uh for, for now it's great that you because you can assess someone you can kind of see mm -hmm. if they're at that stage i would be uh I'd, i'd be concerned for us to sort of we might inadvertently advise someone to <laughs> to try something they shouldn't on something they shouldn't mm -hmm. have you seen anything what's happening with the uh, goggles with you know heads up display kind of like mm. fighter jets pilots is, yeah. is that going to become a thing you think yeah i think so that that's a really cool question because like we've kind of seen uh in the wider sort of tech industry a lot of talk around um like augmented reality mm -hmm. i think um there's a there's a different curve which is it the hype curve where um a product kind of it, it gets very hyped it, it's kind of similar to the um confidence curve but mm -hmm. a product gets hyped a lot and then people get really excited and then it and then it kind of goes out of people pe you know it doesn't work doesn't deliver on mm -hmm. what it is and then eventually people adopt it like, like google glasses google glasses is a really good example i mean virtual reality you know virtual mm -hmm. reality everyone's talking about it in like the 80s and the 90s mm -hmm. but the technology wasn't really there to make it a thing mm -hmm. and now it's actually becoming a, a product so i think with google glass um yeah just yeah it didn't it didn't stick um and i think there were there's been a few companies um that have talked talked about augmented reality in, in skiing mm -hmm. with visual augmented reality and it just it just hasn't kind of been the full package to deliver mm -hmm. the value to the customers and if i and you know I'll, i'll put another plug in for carve but i think one thing we have done is like it's not visual but we have kind of augmented the skiing experience with audio mm -hmm. so having that real-time feedback and for me that actually is, is a better way of getting feedback because it, it's a different part of your brain to doing the visual because mm -hmm. you, you know visually you're looking around you're you're trying to optim you know you're trying to have the best skiing experience you can you're trying to avoid the mm -hmm. skiers and so it's actually quite good to have audio mm -hmm. um i do think what will happen is uh the you know and, and this is actually what apple's talking about now mm -hmm. is there will be more kind of augmented um visual experiences and mm -hmm. and we'll start to have glasses that augment our visual experience 
um but it you know it won't be kind of fully virtual just be sort of extra information and i think once that kind of goes into the mainstream um then i think skiing will kind of pick it up but i think it's probably one of the things that's not going to be innovated by skiing so it's Uh, almost like headphones and airpods mm -hmm. went into the mainstream and um you know airpods are great for skiing because um you know it kind of frees you from the wire Mm -hmm. and once that technology once that technology existed in in the wider world, then the kind of skiing industry can pick it up. But I yeah. think, you know, it, it's a it's a difficult thing for the skiing industry on its own to innovate. Uh, and and there, there have been some attempts, and sadly, they haven't kind of uh, really got off the ground. Mm-hmm. But I might be wrong. That's yeah. that's my bet. <laughs> well, it just makes sense. If mm. this costs tens of millions to make, to make good augmented reality, is hundreds of millions probably. Yeah, yeah. And um, the ski world can't afford that yet yeah exactly yeah we'll we'll, we'll leave the tricky stuff to apple and then and once they've made the good technology we'll we'll Mm -hmm. take it for ourselves once it exists though it would be cool to imagine if you could just do ski racing Mm. uh through your goggles and you got one of those cameras looking forward and then adding gates basically onto the Mm. slope in certain places yeah that you see that looks real yeah you try to ski around them yeah um there's a bunch of cool stuff there yeah it's awesome stuff you could do you probably want it to also be aware of what is in front of it as well, so it can make sure it doesn't place the, the you know, the gates on a, a small child or something. So, mm-hmm. you know, you always got to be careful about the safety side. Yeah, for you watching this, if you think it's cool with like future ski technology, etc., if you come across something that you think is cool, please write it in the comments and uh, enlighten us about what's on the horizon that we have missed, because uh, I don't spend all day looking into the future or into my <laughs> glass ball yeah it's really hard to look into it i, I broke my hand so i'm very <laughs> cast so i can't hold it the way i used to <laughs> well, I look into the future. that's the thing that's holding you back <laughs> yeah exactly i can't twist my hand enough i'm tempted to ask about how well i'm tempted to ask if there are any funny stories from founding this company but maybe before you answer that Maybe you should explain what Carve is. I'm not sure everyone really understands that. Okay, yeah, let's start there. Um, so Carve is a digital ski coach. It's a combination of hardware and software designed to improve your skiing technique. So we have a physical product, which is uh, a thin insert that retrofits into your ski boot. And this insert measures the pressure and the motion under your foot. Um, the insert has a wire that goes up to a little tracker that sits on the side of your um, ski boot and then that sends data to your smartphone and so we have a, a insert in both b- both of your boots mm-hmm. and then what that does is we an- we give you detailed analysis every time you finish a run uh, so we give you a ski IQ score which is kind of like how good you are at skiing um, average person is maybe 115 120 um, going all the way up to sort of 160 for top instructors and then as well as that ski IQ we also give you a tip every run on how you can improve your technique and we also break that down into like different kind of aspects of your skiing technique Mm -hmm. so that's the kind of what we call the free session experience we also have experience which is the real-time experience where as you finish a ski turn you can get feedback on that turn so you hear this like positive sound so if you make a good turn it's like a jing and if you make a bad turn you go "Eh." and so that creates this like very powerful accelerated learning experience because you kind of get this intuition for what a good turn looks like and so um, that's really the kind of main innovation that that kind of like closing the feedback loop is, um, is what we've kind of brought to skiing. Kind of gamify skiing and give feedback. Yeah, after exactly. A turn yeah, immediately. Like, yeah, first of all, gamifying it because you get that mm-hmm. number that you want to ski to see if you can get that better score. But then once we game it, like we 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 then want to help you improve. Oh. So we give you that feedback to improve. So it's not not just making it into a game. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about not bringing that up earlier. <laughs> It's become second nature for both of us as we use it. Um, there must have been some weird stuff going on when founding this company. Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty scrappy in the early days. Um, so uh, I met my uh, co-founder Pruth at, uh, at Imperial, and you know, the f- when we first decided to move to hardware, uh, we were kind of we had a little bit of hardware experience. I mean, mainly Pruth, not so much me. And so we had this concept of like, right, you know, we need to measure pressure and motion in mm-hmm. in a ski boot. So we um, we got one of these things called an Arduino, mm-hmm. and uh, we basically had wires going 
from the Arduino to each foot. So there's like one, you know, uh, we have these like pressure pads underneath the foot uh -huh. that, uh, you know, we literally just stuck them there. Okay. And so we had these ski boots with like wires coming out. And the first prototype we made, we were very, we we're kind of like, we we're, were so cheap. We only had one Arduino. So we had this like, you had to have these like wires coming like along here and then wires along down here. <laughs> and then you have a little box. Yeah. <laughs> and the box is just a random cardboard box. Because yeah. we, we were based at Imperial um, in, the, in the lab. And so we, we kind of got to the stage where we're like, okay, this is ready for testing now. We can, you know, we can take this to the, to the, um, to the UK testing center for CARV. Uh, this is the early days, which was, uh, it was um, a dry slope in Brentwood. Okay. And if you're from the UK, you'll know that Brentwood is pretty much, pretty much the opposite of where we are now. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like kind of on the outskirts of London and um, it's not very hilly, but it does have one hill where they have a dry ski slope. And so we were, um, Pruth and I were, were kind of walking through London um, with uh, essentially two ski boots with these like wires between them and this box. Mm -hmm. And um, we were getting some really strange looks mm -hmm. on the, cause you know, we we're just getting the tube, mm -hmm. you know, getting, getting the tube and then the train. And the whole journey we're getting these really strange looks. Like everyone's like, is that like a bunch of wires coming from a boot? Mm -hmm. I think that this wasn't like too far after the, um, there was like, there was, a, there was a bit of a terrorist scare where um, I think someone like put like a, a shoe bomb or something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, think people are a little bit jittery at the time. A shoe bomb or like a shoe box with a bomb in it? Or? Well, so maybe they thought we, so maybe they thought we we're kind of innovating on the original <laughs> bomb. <laughs> but, skip it bomb. Yeah, a skip it bomb. But, um, you know, people, people kind of associated wires and, mm -hmm. and shoes with like bad things. Mm -hmm. And so we were kind of bumbling around, um, bit kind of lost and confused because yeah. we weren't we've never been to Brentwood before mm -hmm. and so we're kind of like in the main station so London has a few kind of big stations like the hub one off of you know like mm -hmm. a big city and uh we were like in Liverpool Street which is like one of the big ones and we were kind of we, we kind of messed up we weren't sure which thing we needed and Pruth and I were kind of standing around and <laughs> with the boots <laughs> and the wires mm -hmm. and the box all just like all together and then, um, and then this police officer like came next to me. He's just like stood next to me. He's like, um, "What's going on here?" <laughs> and then I was like, "Oh, I don't know." Oh, it wasn't a police officer. It was like a st I thought it was a station guy. Maybe it was a police officer, but I thought it was a station guy. And I was kind of like, "Oh yeah, don't worry." Um, and then I looked around. I was like, "We were like surrounded by police, <laughs> who all looked really nervous." It all looked kind of scared, <laughs> and um, and I uh, and you know they're like, oh, what do you have here? And I was like, okay, this is going to be difficult to explain. So this is digital ski coach. It's the thing you put into your ski boots yeah. and measures. And uh, obviously, you know, this is before Carve and people knew about digital ski coaches. So uh, yeah, after a little bit of explaining, um, we, uh, we we managed to kind of like talk them around. But um, the, the 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 police officer was genuinely genuinely very scared, <laughs> and uh, I, I and he was saying to me, um, you know, uh, we have uh, we have closed all the entrances to Liverpool Street Station. There's no one coming in right now, wow. and we have a gun, a guns like a like an armed response unit and attack dogs <laughs> outside. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm very glad. Um, you know, uh, they didn't. <laughs> you know, they uh, they gave us the benefit for the doubt and went to sort of see us rather than send in the attack dogs um but uh yeah it was a quite quite a funny incident wow. <laughs> so yeah there's a busy subway station fun there must be a very busy subway station. oh yeah it's huge yeah it's like the main one of the main uh one of them is it's a train station yeah. uh in in london and um they close all the people going in <laughs> for mm. us did it cost you something uh a bit of time uh, they took our details <laughs> um, and then they then gave us a plastic bag mm -hmm. and they said, um, yeah, best like don't walk around London with loads of wires mm -hmm. <laughs> hanging out of anything because <laughs> it raises suspicions if someone calls us. So, yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's that's what we learned. Oh, wow. I would feel so awkward. So ashamed. <laughs> but also you hadn't done anything wrong. You carried no, some ski boots. No, I wires. think. I think, I, I mean, to be honest, they were just very relieved. Yeah. Um, you know, I think this police officer was kind of t saying to me, he was like, 
you know, when you get the call, you just don't know what's going to happen, you know. <laughs> so yeah. I think, you know, having, having us bumbling around with a, uh, a couple of ski boots mm -hmm. and an Arduino was, um, was a pretty good result. I, I bet in the minutes leading up to seeing you, when they get the, the call, the heart probably starts pumping. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. For everyone, they're like, shit, what's going to happen? It's yeah. for real this time. Yeah. <laughs> I've only read about it in the news. I've never been yeah. to an actual bomb. Yeah, yeah. But, I think they'd recently been a scare, yeah. So, oh, has something else happened that's been a bit funny in your? Uh, it was so. So my co-founder actually, uh, so Bruce, my co-founder, mm -hmm. he uh, he couldn't actually ski when he started. Ah. So, <laughs> so whereas like I started the company um, wanting to accelerate the learning experience mm -hmm. of skiing, he he really started at zero, and um, I have to I have to admit that uh, I was not a very good instructor. Uh, so our, of the, him, of him, yeah. Uh, so our first, I, I suppose I, I just kind of forgot that some people can't ski at all. Uh, and so our first ski run was actually in Teen, and we were doing, um, we, we were doing a partnership with one of the ski trips, and uh, we we had to work in the morning, but we kind of got out about one o'clock, mm -hmm. and I just said, look, let's just get up the mountain. It doesn't matter, you know. Like we're just going to get to the top and there's like those are like nice blue runs at the mm -hmm. top so i just took any chairlift um and then we we're on the chairlift and uh i was kind of like worked out and i looked at the map mm -hmm. and i realized that this chairlift just went <clears throat> it just went to a red run mm -hmm. but not even the beginning of a red run kind of like halfway down a red run mm -hmm. so um and then proof kind of looked at me having never skied before but with skis on and just said uh oh, what do i do and i was like okay well the run basically went from the right to the left down very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, look, just when you get off, just turn right. Just don't turn left, just ski right. Mm -hmm. uh, so we got to the top and of course he just fell, he just fell down, yeah. <laughs> which is a good result. Um, and then we, uh, and then I had, and then we did, we did a kind of snow plow. Oh no, mm -hmm. so no, it was too steep for snow plow. So we just had to do um, edging mm -hmm. to side slipping. So Proof's first lesson was basically side slipping down a red run, um, and uh, and because it was such a because it took a long time, um, it actually took us about three hours to do the red run, mm -hmm. and by the end of it, um, uh, Proof was kind of doing a bit of snowplow, and then um, they actually wanted to close the run. So the guy, with the snow patrol guy, came, uh, took Proof's skis, mm -hmm. zoomed to the end of the run. Um, with his skidoo, uh, mm -hmm. put them in the thing, and then said, "Okay, you can walk the rest." No, <laughs> so, so that was Proof's first day skiing, um, and uh, hats off to him. He kept skiing <laughs> after that. So, I didn't scare him, and um, you know, I think I kind of set the bar for um, uh, a high, <laughs> high uh, learning curve. Are you going to make curve. a first day on skis mode? <laughs> yes. So I, I, I suppose it can't um, be much that hard to be better than you were. Yeah, yeah. So we uh, we don't do first days in skis. We very explicitly uh, <laughs> recommend people have a, at least a week, if not two weeks, um, uh, with a ski instructor to kind of get a, a feel for it before they uh, they dive into digital coaching. I would agree. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have made videos like first day on skiing, advising people get a ski instructor. But if you don't, if get you're silly like me, <laughs> yeah. living in a place where you can't have a ski instructor, basically. What are you gonna do? Yeah, yeah. So we haven't tried to tackle that, but um, I agree with your approach. <laughs> yeah. What are you gonna do if you can't get it? So then you try, and I can can give some decent advice on video at least. Mm. Oh, poor Pruth. <laughs> but um, does he's, he love skiing now? Yeah, he's pretty good. Uh, I think he's rocking about 130 ski IQ. Mm -hmm. um, I hope I didn't get that too low. <laughs> well, that means it's kind of decent, at least. <laughs> he can he can add on the comments uh, what mm -hmm. his actual ski IQ is. <laughs> yeah. Is there something um, in particular you have on your mind you'd like to talk to me about here? Um, I'd love to hear. Um, you know what what inspires you about Stomp It? Like, um, what Ooh. kind of got you excited? Sorry, I've, I've turned the tables now. <laughs> another one. You and Tom Gelly. <laughs> Uh, what's the exact uh, question about what inspired me to start Stomp It? Yeah, or yeah. Do? Well, it was like I mentioned earlier, the frustration of growing up in uh, Skellefteå, northern Sweden, 
small ski hills you know it's covered in snow six months a year kind of even at um, by the coast basically sea level mm. and it was frustrating to learn to ski myself and at the time there wasn't an internet really or not really good for video yet mm. um casa and you know downloading stuff was starting to work mm. so you could get a hand on uh, some ski films that way or buying it uh, it was just to help myself basically to learn quicker or like a young me but also I got reminded about the difficulties growing up when I was also freestyle coaching in locks for the mm. ski school here and um, I was seeing people crash unnecessarily mm. doing stuff stupid stuff sometimes yeah getting injured doing things that could have been prevented with just some guidance on how to learn stuff i remember specifically one thing that happened me and um co-worker ben we were working up here on the mountain and this british indian guy he went towards this medium-sized jump it had got it a bit poppy the mm. shape wasn't great yeah and no one had ever taught him how to jump properly. So he absorbed it and due to this wonky jump with a kick, he did half a backflip, uh, landed on upside down. Oh, wow. Uh, he was instantly paralyzed. Oh, we were first in the scene, basically. It, awful stuff. Oh, um, yeah. And um, yeah, we get to see the look of his face, you know, when he realized he can't move his legs. Uh, I heard it, it was due to uh, swelling uh, around the nerves. And he, one of his mates called and thanked like a few weeks later and said that doctor think he will be able to walk again. Oh, amazing. Um, so that's amazing. But I've seen stuff like that yeah. repeatedly. And uh, I wanted to spread knowledge about mm. skiing mm. to protect them, but also to help a young myself. So if mm. you're a young person watching this, it's to do it to help you because I used to be you and not having access to that good skiing or any coaching for that matter what mm. coach me was watching videos and comparing it to my videos and i think it it's a blessing in disguise because it made me aware from an early age of um, relating video of an expert to myself mm. and then back again mm. and made me very aware of different movements mm. even if i had to like reason myself to it at the time um but it, that's a long story how i got started basically to help me but also a frustration of seeing others get hurt unnecessarily because it hurts me when other people get hurt mm. i don't want it to happen but inevitably injuries are going to happen when freestyle skiing mm. it's a dangerous thing yeah yeah i mean that's one of the reasons obviously we've we've kept <laughs> you know we, we, we've that's one of the reasons we, we thought very carefully about going into it and how much to do and and obviously um it's an environment that you don't really that we don't understand mm -hmm. so it's much better to leave that that side of things to the professionals yeah. and that guy who broke his back we had nothing to do with him he was just skiing there but it was me and another ski instructor just around coaching kids mm. ourselves mm. helping out there and um doing this thing stomp it it brings me great joy pleasure mm. meaning mm. I love it. It's mm. the best job I could ever have. I get to um, spend time thinking, talking to other coaches and then like um, condense knowledge. So if I make a video sometimes, you know, it's mm. not just me thinking about my own experience. I regularly talk to the other coaches who work mm. with me to like, these are my thoughts about this topic and then they can help me sometimes poke hole in my own thinking mm -hmm. or like, oh, careful with that wording and I'm always happy to learn and mm. so I like to listen to others and try to change so uh, people understand it as well as possible but mm. yeah but I just love it yeah it's I, funny I think I think for me as well that um slightly on the more kind of geeky data side mm -hmm. it's like that that the initial thing that got me interested obviously like thinking about me improving but what really excited me from the kind of step to step mm -hmm. was just sitting down and trying to sort of crack the code of skiing you yeah. know trying to hack skiing um and then seeing you know building up those elements like you know speaking to a coach mm -hmm. and seeing like what they look for and then seeing that work in the data 
was was a really really exciting part of the of the journey so i can i can definitely kind of empathize with that yeah and uh i also started to stop it partially because i always wanted to start a business of some sort i just was mm. drawn to it but i had one answer uh, a question for myself what could i see myself doing for like mm. a decade or two or mm. three you know, I'm almost a, a decade in since I first started off this yeah. company. I think it was December 2012. I bought like a MacBook, um, nice. Adobe Premiere. Yeah. So filming January 2013. But I didn't know how to make videos. So I edited for like a year. I had to delete it all <laughs> because it was so crap. I wanted to go online like within yeah. a year. Um, like January 2014 but it was just it was shit what I had produced yeah and I wasn't happy with it so I went and refilmed here in Lox in yeah. January 2014 and then edited for another year to make some online courses and some YouTube content and then January 2015 it's a big regret I should have posted some of that stuff on the internet <laughs> even if it was ugly and kind of crappy the then advice in back. it was yeah would have been valuable for people yeah so I wish I would have started a little earlier there yeah yeah, then you could point back to it as well and see the see the progress. But I, I think what you've achieved is, is incredible. Um, you know, like the impact you're having, like the amount of people that, that are going through your videos and just you know leveling up their skiing. It's the same thing that we're, you know, we started carp like me and Bruce started carp is is that idea of kind of leveling up people's skiing. It's amazing to think, think that you're having that very wide impact across because so many people watching your videos. Yeah, yeah, it's quite humbling. I am. Uh... I find it kind of scary. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a northern Swedish person, and we are supposed <laughs> to be a little shy and yeah. humble. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I can't afford to be shy. Then we won't be able to make any videos. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then, um, so I've got another question. Um, which bit of carve do you think is is the most exciting? You know, you've you've played with the system a bit. Mm. What is the most exciting? Well, what you just mentioned to me, this uh, video mode with SkiAQ, sounds very exciting, but I haven't mm. tried it. Yeah, we'll definitely get uh, you on that. It, it sounds like it will be valuable, but um, shall I talk as me as a user or, or, or me running, a say, a ski technique camp? As a, yeah, as like thinking about the impact that you can have, because cause that's what we care about, so. <laughs> okay, so me as the coach. Yeah, exactly, like the impact you can have on your skiers. Okay, uh, then it would be, so in a camp setting, we put it in the boots and have people ski, you know, get a little warmed up before you mm. even care about the data. Track it, so day one. Mm. Okay, you, Svenny. If you had an edge angle or whatever, 45 degrees, ski IQ of this, edge similarity of this, okay. And me as a coach, I think your edge, you're really A-framing, mm. like kind of pinching them together. I don't like that. So we're going to work on that first and then see how, as we get rid of this A-frame, the edge similarity is improving, mm. which yeah. is then going to lead to better ski IQ, which is this general score, um, which is then going to lead to, it's kind of, blocks your movement a little bit if you're a-framing like a beginner does like a serious a-frame <laughs> uh, then it can kind of block you from getting higher edge angles and um, yeah because it keeps people accountable it's yeah. hard to argue with it because sometimes we work only with adults mm. kind of like you brainy folks with good jobs at <laughs> Silicon Valley and things yeah um they really need to understand it themselves because they're quite, um, you know, good at math and such things. Mm -hmm. Use that part of the brain. Yeah. And they yeah. really need to understand in detail what's going wrong and how do I need to change it. And then yeah. this data really highlights it to people and keeps them motivated to work on this mm -hmm. thing. Um, and people can be quite stubborn mm. about ski technique and think they know better than the instructor. Yeah. And the instructor is like, hey, I got my two eyes. <laughs> I see that you're still doing it. Yeah, yeah. And we have to change. Yeah. So that is exciting from a coach's perspective. Yeah. To keep people accountable. And also that puts pressure on them. But it also brings the joy of improvement. Because mm -hmm. ideally over a five-day camp, you know, you should see an improvement. Yeah, in, of course. Yeah. In all scores. And that's what typically yeah. takes place. 
But me, me, Jens, as a pretty good skier, yeah. uh, I like to have it when I'm training to get my turns better, to track it. Yeah. And then I look at the score. How am I doing on things right now? Um, there are some simple things to just push myself. Um, try to get that edge angle super high. Just crank it in. Yeah. Go nice. wild. And um, I'm probably skiing alone when I use the carve unit. Mm. I typically do. And it just keeps me more engaged and it keeps me trying a bit harder mm. uh, it has this gamify gamification modes like the um the, the carve challenge what do you call it the 18 levels yeah uh, carving training Car carving training yeah 20 it levels. pretty difficult by the end of it it's very i, I can't complete it <laughs> I, I, I was one or two levels short uh last time i used it but i haven't used it for like two years but it's actually fun yeah um so, so i do like that mm. i i must do all of them i think mm. i can do it now i'm pretty sure yeah you, you uh, can I just, I <laughs> i've seen you a, ski <laughs> yeah i gave it a try two years ago and um yeah i should give that another go and that's pretty fun mm. but uh, for me it's the main thing track data i look at one metric edge angle and then be like hmm let's get it higher yeah or nice. uh, more symmetrical yeah. like I almost only look at, I'll go through all the metrics and I'm like, which one am I short on mm, today? Yeah. And then like, okay, that one I'm bad at. Okay. How can I get that ba better? Or why is it bad? Ask yeah. me these questions and then I try. Yeah. Awesome. So it's uh, the whole accountability and um, engage myself a mm. little bit more. Yeah. I think focus is such a, a strong thing that we can give people because knowing that it's measured mm -hmm. just if i tell you i'm, I'm going to watch you mm -hmm. you're going to ski better right because yeah. you're you're, th you're like you're trying yeah and i think keeping that keeping that focus is 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 one first step that is is very powerful in itself yeah um obviously then we you know we 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 score it and that's why you have the focus but then you also have the um the feedback as well to mm -hmm. try and improve and then for each of the metrics you, you talked about we we do have an explanation of the metric and we try and give people mm -hmm. um, tips about what they can do. But I find when you're at the very top of your kind of game skiing, then it'll be a lot of almost internal things. So you'll say, oh, my edge angle wasn't quite as much on my left turn. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's because you're kind of worried about an injury or there was some kind of latent yeah. thing. And then you try and try and work against that. So work to sort of get, mm -hmm. get past that. And I think it does a good job at this, uh, bringing the attention. Something uh, me and Magnus Granier, a famous freestyle skier, mm. uh, from a podcast from a little while ago, were talking about the importance of having fun in your sport. You've got to push yourself to some extent. And uh, the most famous psychologist in the field of uh, flow research, Mihaly, this Czech mm. dude with an impossible to say last name, <laughs> you said for flow. <laughs> Uh, you'll find his thoughts on it and it's the idea of the flow channel yeah, and yeah. I've struggled with this that basically to have fun doing your sport and to improve you need to have a challenge that matches your skills or that pushes you you know maybe a little bit beyond your skill yeah exactly and then you're gonna have serious improvement and you gotta stay in this channel because if you fall below the channel I'd, I was doing this maybe in 2013, 14 with my freestyle skiing. Yeah. I didn't really have a purpose to keep pushing. Mm. But thanks to Stompy, they got a purpose to push again. Mm -hmm. So when I didn't have the purpose, I basically got a little bored, a little yeah. relaxed. Yeah. It was easy. And I had to race that uh, into the channel. But yeah. then there's the problem if you push too hard, you get anxious. Yeah. And that's debilitating for your um, performance. Yeah. So, for example, I wanted to learn double cork uh, a few years ago in video. Wow. <laughs> I want to, yeah, I was 26 uh, a few years ago. And uh, the, the nerves were a little bit debilitating at first. Mm. And it's to know that uh, if you push that hard, it, it's no good. <laughs> uh, then I had to back off basically and do a bunch of uh, yeah. practicing and trampoline. Yeah, trampoline. And really work it through my head and water mm. ramps, etc. Mm. to uh, yeah lower that challenge to so get into the flow channel again and did you do it oh yeah <laughs> oh, the yeah. first, first <laughs> attempt awesome and yeah. i crashed the second a little bit yeah um but it, it, it's a cool little video 
yeah it's my most advanced uh ski tutorial on youtube so far yeah that's pretty advanced <laughs> i can how to double cork i think there's only one video. <laughs> oh, oh i made two videos yeah two parts because i thought it was yeah kind of a big topic and i made many mistakes doing it because mm. my like cork seven cork five yeah technique yeah was a suboptimal yeah leading me to to double cork 1260s instead of double cork 1080s yeah you need better technique to rotate less yeah does that make sense to you with your physics degree um no it doesn't <laughs> <laughs> okay so um better uh, technique to rotate less yeah okay so i'm holding a phone in my hand and i'm making this cork motion did you see how it yeah, did this wo wobble yeah. and um Basically, if you have a long stick and rotate mm. it, it needs more rotations to do one of these cork motions. Yeah. So you need to have a kind of better technique yeah. to complete one of these cork flipping motions. Yeah. Uh, with only a 540 mm. and then another 540. Yeah. So since my technique wasn't so good, it took a whole 720 to do the first one. Yeah. And then, what is it? A... Um, like uh, too much rotation on the next one because mm. then i would have had to do basically just a cork three wow. to make it a two, 1080 yeah cork three is a difficult trick to do <laughs> and uh, i'd made a 540 out instead so i needed to do basically a cork five and then straight away go into the next cork five yeah these are tricks you're not that into but maybe you yeah this is uh a very formidable <laughs> does it make sense Challenge. to you now with a physics degree yeah i can i can see that yeah with the with the different rotations and how they interact with each other i think what's what's so hard is because because I, I i love this idea of the flow channel like we think so much about it mm -hmm. and you know if a game is too easy then you just get bored mm -hmm. um and if it's too hard then you just give up and so it's it's finding that encouraging channel that like pushes people through step by step and it's funny your example to give a um you know to talk about doing uh, these freestyle tricks because we're l privileged in carb in that we can generally teach things in quite incremental steps whereas mm. obviously when you do a freestyle trick uh like a like a cork <laughs> like a double cork um you know you can't do uh 1.5 corks <laughs> no but you can be still a bit incremental in, yeah. in the sense that i spent i was 26 so i spent a decade being able to do cork five sevens and nines mm. And that's a decade if i paid more attention to that could have yeah. built a, a better foundation mm. yeah so i could have done the cork 10 instead of 12 perhaps yeah and so that was kind of incremental and before that you know i spent years learning 180s 360s 540s 720s without the cork yeah, yeah and then like adding it and then you can do it incrementally on the trampoline that makes sense where you can do one and a half corks yeah <laughs> yeah um but yes yeah, skiing is incremental in a different sense Mm. But it also imposes different challenges teaching uh, skiing from an intermediate skier who can carve to the best in the world. Mm. It doesn't look so incremental. Well, it is incremental, mm. but it's in a kind of weird and less satisfying way. Because mm. freestyle skiing, you know, going from uh, jumping to a 180 to a 360 when the goal is stub 12, uh, you have many satisfying little milestones mm. and i find it harder to keep that same excitement going mm. uh, with the piece performance that's quite interesting because you have that step up and that step you see that step and that difference creates mm -hmm. like all that kind of joy yeah yeah because yeah. it's a completely different feeling landing a 540 versus a 360 mm. or then a cork 5 versus a 5 mm -hmm. you feel absolutely different yeah while a good turn and a little bit better turn. They don't feel so much different at first. Yeah. It's just when you put in hard work, it, it will really kind of pay off. Mm. And that's where I do think you guys are killing it to make that more interesting for yeah. people who care. Yeah, because you get that kind of incremental increase in ski IQ. Yeah. And you're like, oh yeah, that was a good run. And you, and, and you can kind of see those points tick up, mm -hmm. which, is, which is quite hard um, if you're just kind of, just sort of working off your feeling. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's what maybe is one of the reasons why the average skiers are so hard to get back into ski schools is that they just ski with their friends, which they're happy with, 
Mm. But they also maybe get a little bored. They're probably under that flow channel mm. regularly. Yeah, yeah. And you need some external push yeah. Yeah. to go up there. Yeah, yeah. Which can be just go faster to that person with the bad technique, straight line in that yeah. steep run. Or hopefully using the curve system to, <laughs> yeah, if you want to. <laughs> to drive improvement. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, the, the flow channel is uh, great. Mm. Do you have some more questions for me or uh, something you want to talk about? Um, uh, okay. You don't have to push it out. <laughs> I think we had a great chat. Yeah, I really, no, really enjoyed this. Um, uh, I didn't think of all these questions I'd have to ask. Uh, I'd be asking you. Yeah, no um, worries. No worries. But uh, maybe you want to tell the audience where they can find you and learn more about what you guys are doing at Carve. Yeah, absolutely. So um, all the all the information on Carve is on getcarve.com uh, and that's spelled G-E-T-C-A-R-V.com. So no E. Uh, and you can also find us on Instagram uh, at getcarve. Excellent. Thank <laughs> you so much for coming. I yeah, really enjoyed talking fun. about ski tech with you. It's been super fun. Thanks yes. so much. So uh, see you guys in the next one. Ciao.